about um, a book by uh, uh, Nicholas Carderas. Uh, it's a book called Digital Madness. Uh, really fascinating book. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. There it is. That's what it looks like. How social media is driving our mental health crisis and how to restore our sanity by Nicholas Carderas. Uh, kind of an interesting book. One of the things that, I, and I've left some of it out, uh, he's uh, uh, come up with uh, various uh, solutions to the problem. One of them is to go near the salt water. I, I left that out. <laughs> anyway. Uh, okay. Most scientists uh, operate using the precautionary principle. If a scientist thinks a particular action or invention uh, may be too risky or profoundly negative, then it's best uh, not to proceed. And of course, this in this should have included um, uh, our online uh, aspect. Um, but uh, what happened was uh, that people thought that uh, this would be a way to get every, everyone connected um, so that they could communicate with one another. Well, that's, that did happen, but uh, at the same time, now we have video games and we have social media, um, and there are a lot of negative things that go along with it. And uh, once we discovered that... Uh, negative things were occurring, we didn't do anything about it. The scientific community didn't do anything about it. They just kept uh, inventing things. They kept inventing, inventing uh, algorithms uh, to get people more uh, addicted to uh, some of these things. And uh, so that's the way it works. The clinical fallout from the social media contagion has created a tech-addicted, impulsive, hypersensitive, egocentric, instant gratification society with its polarizing social media echo chambers. It has bred an angry, intolerant, narcissistic, and borderline-like volatile population. And we're going to talk about uh, two of the problems we're going to talk about. One of them is uh, TikTok, TikTok Tourette's, and the other is uh, borderline uh, personality disorder. And we're going to talk about those fairly extensively. Borderline personality disorder typified by all or nothing black and white uh, thinking is now our cultural diagnosis where hysterical all caps tweets and political extremism uh, on both ends of the spectrum have replaced rational critical thinking and civil discourse. Tech addiction, mental illness, and polarization uh, many remorseful uh, tech defectors lament that this is, uh, had not been the plan. Uh, this was not the way that things were supposed to be. Social media are tools that are ripping apart the social fabric of how so uh, society works. No civil discourse, no cooperation, misinformation, mistruth. Nobody ever intended any of these consequences. Once Google realized how easy it was to generate money via the search engine itself through the sale of keywords to eager companies rather than the clutter of selling sp ad space like their competitors had been doing, uh, it, was, it was game on. All high-minded, lofty ideals fell by the wayside. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but Google wasn't the first search engine. Uh, the first was uh, Yahoo and... Uh, then came Bing, and then came Google. Gaming addiction is so severe in the military that there have been several documented and shocking cases of military babies dying in the crib from parental neglect as their fathers played marathon video game sessions. The problem became so significant that the Department of Defense uh, had to create a new cause of death for the infant death certificates, Death due to electronic distraction. Research has shown that people who are predisposed toward addiction have lower baseline levels of dopamine, as well as other neurotransmitters, such as endorphins and norepinephrine. Thus, they're more likely to get hooked on any substance or behavior 
that increases dopamine because their brains crave it more than those of people who have normal baseline neurotransmitter levels. Many people with addiction are co comorbid. They are also struggling with another mental health disorder. 85% of people struggling with addiction have other mental health issues, whether they're diagnosed or not. The two big ones are depression and anxiety. Major, uh, majority of people who struggle with addiction will also say they struggle with depression and or anxiety and are self-medicating with the addiction. The problem is that addiction and mental health disorders are bidirectional forces that synergize and amplify one another. Brain imaging research shows that eating can raise dopamine levels by 50%, while sex can raise dopamine by 100%. Snorting cocaine increases dopamine by 350%, and ingesting crystal meth creates a whopping 1,200% increase in dopamine. Brain imaging studies show that video games increase dopamine as much as sex, about 100%. A person is getting a brain orgasm every time they play a video game. Research looking at rats in caged or open spaces found that the rats in open spaces rejected the need to consume the addictive substances available, while the caged rats routinely overdosed themselves to death. Addiction counselors often describe their clients as becoming addi addicted in order to escape from their perceived toxic environment. Humans can be physically free, yet still feel uh, trapped in a cage psycholo psych psychologically. The person who hates their job, but can't quit for financial reasons. Human, uh, the person stuck in a bad marriage. The person with no job or housing opportunities. The person suffering from a debilitating physical or psychological condition. The person who sits in front of a glowing screen for hour after hour every single day is also in a caged environment. The same researchers who did the caged rat studies also looked at humans and their environmental conditions. They found native peoples of Canada and the United States had been put in their own Skinner boxes, reservations and reserves that denied them their traditional cultural connections, practices, and social bonds. Before the colonization of Native Americans, there were hardly any records of addiction. Once the Native peoples were colonized, alcoholism became close to universal. There were entire reserves where virtually every teenager and adult was either an, alcohol, uh, an alcoholic or drug addict or on the wagon. The question is, does our current high-tech world breed the hyper-individualistic, hyper-competitive, frantic, crisis-ridden society described in the caged rat research that was, that was the driver of addiction? A reasonable person would have to answer yes. A record number of deaths among young people have been attributed to what have been dubbed deaths of despair which according to the CDC took over 200,000 lives in pre-COVID 2019 due to drug overdoses, suicide, and chronic alcoholism. So many young people had died during the period between uh, 2017 and 2019 that the average U.S. life expectancy had decreased for the first time in over 100 years. Not since the global devastation of the influenza pandemic of 1918 had we seen average lifespan rates decrease in the United States. Some of the despair is economic and the byproduct of hopelessness over lack of meaningful employment, but it also seems to be more than just those circumstances, as statistics show that millennials are suffering from a loneliness epidemic. One in five millennials have zero friends and describe feeling lost and empty. Our high-octane dopamine spiked screen experiences have primed young people, habituated them, to need higher and higher levels of intensity to get the same dopamine rush. They've developed a dopamine tolerance 
and need higher and higher doses to feel something, to feel anything. The humdrum real world seems extremely boring to a person perpetually overstimulated and awash in the constant stream of social media, gaming, and other dopamine spiking digital uh, platforms. The problem then becomes doing uh, anything that doesn't involve the dopamine spiking screens. For example, sitting in a classroom, uh, former hobbies, face-to-face -face relationships, a walk in nature, it leaves a person feeling understimulated as they experience an inevitable dopamine crash, a depression, boredom, emptiness, and, and anhedonia, where experiencing pleasure can feel impossible. Young people have been robbed of the ability to develop the skills of patience in our instant gratification digital age. That's extremely toxic, not just because impulsivity also uh, correlates uh, highly with negative future outcomes like substance addiction, but also because the things that typically give a person their most profound sense of purpose and meaning usually take time to earn or achieve. Yet if a person is primed for impulsivity and impatience, as research, research shows that those on high-octane screen diets are, then they are also missing out on finding those rewarding, special, and potentially life-defining, me meaningful accomplishments. Why do the young feel so empty and hopeless, which has manifested in suicide at record rates, over 47,000 suicides, and 1,380,000 attempts in 2019? Being sedentary in and of itself has, been, has proven to be a significant driver of depression. Psychologists have known for decades that the best non-pharmaceutical antidepressant is physical activity. Anything that gets uh, the body moving also increases serotonin levels and helps to oxygenate the brain. Researchers know that humans were never designed for the sedentary, indoor, sleep-deprived, socially isolated, fast-food-laden, frenetic pace of modern life. Diseases of despair and even depression, both lifestyle-impacted ailments, were essentially non-existent in non-industrial and indigenous societies. Studies with women found that numerous chronic small stressors lead to depression. It seems that chronic numerous small stressors create a ripe condition for depression that can be triggered by a single bad life event. It isn't just one negative event that triggers depression, but chronic stressors over a long period of time before the one acute event takes place and acts as the tripping point. The more positive stabilizing factors women have in their lives the less likely they are uh, diagnosed with depression, even if they have chronic long-term stress and, acute, uh, and an acute episode. A healthy, supportive environment rich with stabilizing factors such as supportive friends, close family members, or a supportive partner all works to immunize the person from getting depression. Depression can be caused by a long-term toxic lifestyle. A chronically stressful life that leads to depression will indeed alter a person's brain chemistry. It is the toxic lifestyle, however, that causes the neurochemical imbalance associated with depression. Dis disconnection from meaningful work. If you're working at a dead-end job that you hate and that uh, gives you a little sense of gives you little sense of purpose or passion and that offers you little control or autonomy, that's a problem. Disconnection from people, this is a reflection of our loneliness epidemic. We don't share any meaningful experience with other people, and your cat doesn't count. Disconnection from meaningful values, letting the shallow and materialistic so-called influencers and out uh, and our popular culture and our popular culture shape the values of our society so that they're based on materialism and extrinsic rewards rather than intrinsic values influencers disconnection caused by childhood trauma 
Trauma does lead to mental health issues, and the traumatic experience you go through as a child significantly increases the likelihood of a later diagnosis of depression. Disconnection from respect. The compromised self-concept and dignity of people in dehumanizing and oppressive systems can, uh, can uh, also lead to depression. Disconnection from the natural world. People profoundly need a connection to nature and the natural world and become very unwell when they are removed from contact with the natural world. Native American warriors went insane when they were forced into captivity on reservations and lost their connection with nature. Animals in zoos experience what is called zoocosis as they rock uh, back and forth and often hurt themselves. And this is a a zebra trying to chew his way through a wire fence. Disconnection from loss of hope for better future. When a person cannot clearly see a hopeful path forward in their lives, they can develop feelings of learned hopelessness and helplessness and depression. Americans are 10 times more likely to have depressive illness than they were 60 years ago. Recent studies found that the rate of depression has more than doubled in just the past decade. While low-tech societies like the American Amish have almost non-existent levels of depression. Six lifestyle changes from caveman therapy. Get regular daily exercise. Get involved in social activity where social connections are made. Eat an omega-3 rich diet get plenty of natural sunlight, get ample sleep every night, participate in meaningful tasks that leave little time for negative thoughts. If you take a depressed person and have them live a, a, a more back-to-basics to uh, type of lifestyle, their dis depression will disappear. It is the struggle for survival that hones and sharpens a sanity-sustaining sense of purpose which humans need. All people benefit from time outdoors in nature. Psychological benefits include reduced stress, anxiety, and depression. The psychological benefits include improved concentration and cognitive function, pain control, and faster recovery time from injuries. The additional Benefits include greater happiness, life satisfaction, reduced aggression, and better social connections. <clears throat> the culprit in our mental health crisis is a toxic modern civilization. We are simply not meant to live sedentary, overstimulated, more isolated and atomized, less communal, nature disconnected, meaning devoid, hyperkinetic, sleep deprived, and overstressed 21st century lives. Years ago, social scientists identified what they called sociogenic or social contagion effects, behaviors, emotions, or disorders spread by social networks or groups of people. It is monkey see, monkey do social learning theory. Modeling, peer pressure, and groupthink all rolled into one. Smoking because your friends smoke, listening to country music and going to NASCAR races because you moved to Nashville and have a new group of friends. You start laughing at a movie because everyone else is laughing. You go skinny dipping because your friends are swimming naked wearing sombreros. And I don't know what that says. Me, I can't, I can't read it. In 2019, Harris Poll of school children in China and, U and the UK and the United States asked them if they would rather be an astronaut, a musician, a professional athlete, a teacher, or a vlogger slash YouTuber. While 56% of children in China went to be a, want to be a, an astronaut, the leading professional aspiration in both the UK and the United States was vlogger, YouTuber. Social media influencers are people who have large audiences or followers on their social media accounts, and they leverage this to influence or persuade this following to, uh, to buy certain products or services. 
Kylie, Kylie Jenner has 278 million Instagram followers and is reputed to be worth $700 million. And that's Kylie Jenner. I don't really know this lady, but I guess if you're on Instagram, you do. The influencer is entirely defined. Uh, their entire sense of value is de determined by the number of followers they have. The influencer groupthink paradigm makes popularity and not quality. The primary value, uh, does this cause a sense of valueless emptiness? Almost everyone feels a sense of uh, emptiness. 61% of Americans report feeling lonely. Nearly half say they feel left out. And Gen Z are the loneliest of all, with 68% saying they feel that no one really knows them. And this is a guy by the name of Mr. Beast, and he is the most popular guy on the internet. Uh, I was uh, sitting behind uh, an individual, just a little girl. She was probably seven or eight years old, and she was watching a Mr. Beast video. I, and I was, I had never heard of this guy before. And the only reason I know him is because I looked up to see who had the most followers. And there he is right there. That's Mr. Beast. Uh, it turns out that Mr. Beast yells a lot. Uh, he gets really excited about a lot of different, really strange things like playing video games. And he makes a lot of money. Mr. Beast. In 2012, Facebook researchers used nearly 700,000 Facebook users as guinea pigs, sending them happy or sad posts to test whether or not emotions can be contagious on social media. Facebook actually did this research. Some people, they sent happy uh, messages. Some people, they sent, sent sad messages to. They used 700,000 Facebook users. users. What did they find out? Yes, the emotions shared via social media did have social contagion effect and were contagious. In other words, if they sent them happy messages, they were happy. If they sent them sad messages, they were sad. Facebook had done internal research that had indicated that Instagram has harm, uh, was harming teenage girls by increasing their thoughts of suicide and exacerbating eating disorders, and yet did nothing to change the algorithms that were causing the harmful imagery because it was thought that it would decrease engagement. And, of course, engagement is how they make their money. Facebook would often selectively exempt high-profile users known as X-Check clients, like celebrities, politicians, and journalists, and would allow them to post content that violated Facebook's content policy against posts that contained harassment or that could incite violence. And as of 2020, there were 5,800,000 X-Check users. And he's the biggest villain. And this guy has just been arrested for trafficking underage girls in Romania. And I can't think of his name, but he's a very popular male, uh, male vlogger. Facebook made a conscious decision in 2018 to use an alg algorithm that they knew would increase anger among its users because they knew that anger was a more profitable emotion to elicit as an increased platform engagement. And that's what they're looking for, platform engagement. The more you go from one screen to the other, the more likely that they will sell their products. Facebook allowed bad actors and foreign entities uh, access to its platform by consistently understaffing its counter-espionage uh, information uh, operations and counter-terrorism teams, which Hagen... Uh, considers a national security threat. While Hagen was a Facebook employee from 2019 to 2021, she spent time working on the company's counter-espionage team and saw China using Facebook to surveil Uyghur uh, dissidents and Iran using it for espionage. So this is testimony by Frances uh, Hogan. I'm sorry, her name's Hogan. And she went before Congress and, and testified. And that's what she found out, that they had the X-Check people, that they, uh, they utilized um, algorithms that they knew were harming 
young girls, uh, causing eating disorders, and they did it anyway. They did this, this insane research, sending some people bad messages, unhappy messages. Crazy. While Facebook may present a facade of, benevolent uh, company, of a benevolent company whose goal is to connect people, their actual agenda is user engagement and profit, often at the expense of their users. Facebook researchers found that 32% of teen girls said that when they felt bad about their bodies, Instagram made them feel worse from an internal slide presentation in 2020. Comparisons on Instagram can change how young uh, women view and describe themselves. From a Facebook slide presentation in 2019, we make body image issues worse for one in three teen girls. Teens blame Instagram for increases in the rate of anxiety and depression. This reaction was unprompted and consistent across all groups. This is something, this is what they are stating on a Facebook slide presentation. They know this is taking place. Francis Hogan is the one that, that, uh, that took these um, uh, slides and she presented them to Congress as proof that Facebook knew exactly what was taking place. Among teens who reported suicidal thoughts, 13% of British users and 6% of American users traced the desire to kill themselves to Instagram. Another Facebook slide presentation showed, and yet they still refused to change the toxic algorithm. As insane as that is, Instagram curates images of anorexia to teen girls who have anorexia and, have, uh, and other eating disorders, by barraging them with photos and videos of other malnourished girls, a practice that experts say has shown to worsen their eating disorders as it triggers their unhealthy compulsions. The National Association of Anorexia Nervosa and Associated Disorders reported that 5 to 10 percent of anorexics die within 10 years after developing the disease. 5 to 10 percent die within 10 years. 18 to 20 percent of anorexics will be dead after 20 years. Only 30 to 40 percent will ever recover fully. The Wall Street Journal created a dozen fake TikTok accounts registered as 13-year-old girls. Within weeks, the accounts were sent tens of thousands of weight loss videos. Some videos included uh, Tops about 300, uh, 300 calorie a day restrictive diets. Others recommended consuming only water or taking laxatives, while others showed videos of emaciated girls with protruding bones and shaming comments for those who wanted to reject these extreme diet ideas. These are actual pictures off of Instagram that I'm showing you. Look how skinny these ladies' legs are. This is real. Wait a minute, where's the other one? That one, there we go. These are actually on Instagram. 40% of Instagram users are 22, uh, and young, 22 years old and, and younger, and about 22 million teens log on to Instagram in the United States each day, compared with only 5 million teens logging into Facebook, where young users have been shrinking for a decade. On average, teens in the United States spend 50% more time on Instagram than they do on Facebook. And there we go again. Look how narrow this lady's legs are. Zuckerberg refused to incorporate the proposed fixes because he feared people would in interact with Facebook less. Facebook only does well when its users are unwell. Everyone emotionally triggered and staring at a screen for 24 hours a day would be the ultimate success for Facebook's bottom line, but wouldn't be so great for humanity, as you can see from her legs and 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 her legs. And her legs.
That is skinny. Academic research shows that teens on a screen for more than five hours per day were 20% more likely to have suicidal ideations and actions than teens on a screen for less than an hour a day. In 2017, the American Journal of Epidemiology followed the Facebook use of more than 5,000 people over three years and found that higher use correlated with self-reported declines in physical health, mental health, and life satisfaction. Pediatricians all over the world noticed during the COVID uh, year uh, 2020 that teenage, teenage girls were on TikTok and who were following a popular TikTok influencer who made videos about her tick disorder started manifesting behaviors consistent with Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's is a nervous system disorder that causes people to make repetitive and voluntary movements or sounds, typically affects more boys than girls by a rate of 3 to 1, and tends to be diagnosed at a young age. Linked to various parts of the brain, it includes a basal ganglia, which helps control body movements, and it also seems to have a genetic or hereditary component. New cases were flooding into pediatric hospitals in the United States, Canada, the UK, and Australia. They were mostly teen girls instead of boys, and instead of the more common facial tics, most had exaggerated hand and arm movement, and also what's known as coprolalia, the repetitive and involuntary use of obscene language, which is quite rare among those with genuine Tourette's. And that's the movement they were talking about. At Texas Children's Hospital, the caseload for patients with ticks had multiplied by several dozen since March of 2020. At Johns Hopkins Tourette Center, they went from a pre-pandemic rate of 2 to 3 percent of pediatric patients to a staggering 10 to 20 percent of their pediatric patients showing signs of a tick disorder. At Rush Medical Center in Chicago, their rate of patients reporting ticks had doubled after 2020 with the vast majority of new Tourette's patients being female. And that is what, that's another, that's actually a tick disorder. That's Tourette's. Some researchers and clinicians had developed the term Munchausen by Internet, or digital factitious disorder. Most of the teens had some level of psychiatric history, depression, or anxiety, and the Tourette's influencers themselves did not present with uh, the types of tics that seasoned medical professionals have come to expect from genuine tick disorder. It is certainly possible that certain disorders can be subconsciously mimicked. For doctors who work with some of the TikTok Tourette's cases, they indicate that most of the teens were previously diagnosed with anxiety or depression that had either been brought on or exacerbated by the pandemic and that then seemingly made them more vulnerable to mimicking something like Tourette's syndrome or any other type of witness disorder. Witness disorder. In 1774, in uh, Goethe published a novel called The Sorrows of Young Werther. The novel was about a love triangle between Werther, young Charlotte, and Charlotte's older husband-to-be, Albert. Werther, without uh, prospects and poor, decided that someone had to die to end the unpalatable conundrum. Werther borrowed two pistols from Albert and shot himself in the head. The novel was a resounding success. Lovesick men all over Europe dressed up like Werther and shot themselves in the end to end their pain in a phenomenon known as Werther fever. The problem became so severe that the book was banned in Italy and Denmark. The Sorrows of Werther. Werther fever was a classic social contagion effect. With suicides, the thinking goes like this. When one person does something extreme, it lowers the threshold and makes it more permissible for the next person to do it. And the same for the next person and each subsequent person thereafter. And thus, with each successive suicide, it becomes more and more normative and acceptable for the next person to do it. And these are known as suicide clusters. Uh, when I was uh, living in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, we had a suicide cluster in a high school, uh, in a Catholic high school, strangely enough, 
uh, in uh, just uh, just outside of Omaha, Bryan High School, and uh, they had uh, 17 attempts and five completed suicides, but they had 17 attempts. And so what they did, they brought in a group of uh, suicide specialists from New York City. They volunteered to come out to Omaha, Nebraska, to work with these uh, kids committing suicide. Well, the the kids the kids at Bryan High School were most of the the uh, suicide experts uh, coming in from New York City were psych psychiatrists. Uh, they were uh, from the city. They were from New York. Uh, they were Jewish, and they were coming in to try to help the uh, country kids of Omaha, Nebraska, uh, who were Catholic. And uh, as soon as the uh, the counseling started. Uh, there was a huge hue and cry because they didn't have a clue what these kids were about. These kids were were country kids, uh, the, and these most of these psychiatrists had never been outside of New York City, so they had no idea who they were. They didn't have a clue what was going on. You know, a psychologist can help every anybody, right? Well, that's not the way it worked. It did stop the suicide, and the reason it stopped the suicide was because the community came together to get rid of these guys, to, to, to throw them out. Uh, and that's what happened. And because of the, 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 the positive hue and cry, the uproar about these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, psychi psychiatrists coming in from New York, uh, that's what stopped the, uh, the cluster. It stopped it at uh, 17 attempts and five, five successful suicides. But what happens is when one person commits suicide, they everybody looks at them. They say, "Oh, that's that's the head. It, actually it was one of the head cheerleaders. It, it was the uh, uh, football head cheerleader. It was the first one to commit suicide, and then another popular kid committed suicide. The captain of the basketball team, and then after that, it became normative for that uh, for that to happen." Social media has become a seemingly sentient uh, organism that feeds off of uh, primal id, our primal id, and then regurgitates those baser impulses back on us in high-octane form, not only intensified, but veiled by the normalcy of community. In the dark web, there are all sorts of groups catering to the once socially outcast. Entire virtual communities are devoted to everything from bondage enthusiasts to cannibalism to pedophile uh, groups, to all manner of fetishes and or deviances. The problem is that some fetish groups can cross the line into full-blown illeg illegality or violence. Complicating things even further when it comes to fetish sites are the distinctions between fantasy and reality. An example would be the cannibal cop of, of the New York Police Department, who was a member of an online cannibal chat room and was then arrested for conspiracy to commit murder. His defense attorneys argued that it was all just elaborate, perverse internet cannibal cosplay. He was just living out a fantasy online and would never have been pushed to carry out his fantasies into real-life violence. And eventually he was acquitted. Uh, initially, he was uh, convicted of uh, using... Uh, Police department uh, databases uh, to to find these addresses, and he that's that's you know what he was doing. It looked like he was about to uh, to commit a uh, a heinous crime, uh, so they convicted him. Uh, he was in jail for about twenty two months, and then he was uh, they threw it out. The uh, New York Supreme Court threw it out and said uh, you can't you you can't arrest somebody for thinking about it. Some online groups start off as one thing, usually benign and harmless, then mutate into something quite different and potentially more lethal. The incel movement started out as a support group for the lonely and awkward of all genders, but morphed into a subculture of misogynistic and angry young men, some of whom have committed mass murder in the name of their mutated and misguided cause. And they hate Stacy's and they hate Chad. Stacy is the... Uh, is the girl that teases them, and Chad is her boyfriend. 
The incel movement is, per, is a perfect case study of what can happen when an initially innocent group of lonely people looking for kinship and support get twisted and perverted through the amplification and extremification of digital media. These lovable yet romantically challenged souls eventually became a community and began calling their issues involuntary celibacy and later adopted the shorthand incels to describe themselves, involuntary celibates. The incel world of the 1990s and early 2000s was a friendly place where awkward men and women would talk to one another about relationship support and advice. With technology and the internet acting as a hatred accelerant, sexual frustration has turned to hatred, and hatred has spilled over into full-blown premeditated acts of violence and murder against women and the, and the men that they love. Since 2014, at least eight mass murders with 61 fatalities have been attributed to men who either self-identified as incels or, ha or who had incel-related writings on the internet. On May 23, 2014, Elliot Roger went on a shooting, stabbing, and vehicular uh, rampage where he killed six and injured 14 near the uh, University of California Santa Barbara campus. After the carnage, he took the path of the fictional Werther and shot himself in the head. Virtually canonized by his online fans, he has been referenced as the inspiration by the incel community. Mass, in, mass violence by incels is regularly, regularly referred to as going ER for Elliot Roger. On 23 April 2018, Alec Manazian uh, rented a rider truck and used it to run over and kill 10 people in downtown Toronto, Canada and injure another 16. Shortly before his attack, he posted on Facebook citing the incel rebellion and giving kudos to Elliot Roger. The incel rebellion has begun. We will overthrow all the Chads and Stacys. All hail the Supreme Gentleman, Elliot Roger. Incels are not merely an isolated subculture disconnected from the outside world. They are a dark reflection of a set of social values about women that is common, if not dominant, in broader Western society. The intersection between this age-old misogyny and new information technologies is reshaping our policies and culture in a way that we may only dimly understand and may not be prepared to confront. There have been 1,316 school shootings in the United States since 1970. According to experts, school gun violence falls into two broad categories. The larger number of gun incidents resulting in death occur at inner-city schools related to incidents related to conflicts between students that reflect crime, drugs, and gang activity, and it's mostly involved with minority students. The smaller number are mass shooter uh, incidents that affect suburban white schools and are fueled by mass acts of revenge. And it all started with Charles Whitman. Charles Whitman, Whitman was a former Marine. He mounted uh, the University Tower uh, in, uh, at the University of Texas in 1966, and he began sni sniping the, the people that he saw. 96 minutes later, he was shot and killed by police, but not before he killed 14 and wounded 30 others. Three months after Whitman's rampage, 18-year-old copycat Bob Smith entered the Rosemark College of Beauty in Mesa, Arizona, and shot seven people, killing five. He later told police that he was inspired by Whitman's act. On 20 April 1999, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold opened fire on their schoolmates in a school in suburban Denver and killed 12 and wounded 21. Klebold and Harris were lonely gamers who had been bullied into a vengeful rage. They had originally intended to blow up their school, but settled on a mass shooting retaliatory strike against the kids whom they felt mistreated them. Beginning with Whitman in 1966 and since Columbine in 1999, school shootings have gone viral in the digital age. 
In 2005, Red Lake High School in Minnesota, eight were killed. That's on a, on Red Lake uh, uh, Chippewa Reservation in, uh, in Minnesota. 2007, Virginia Tech, 33 were killed. 2008, Northern Illinois University, five were killed. Uh, 2012, Oikos uh, University in California, seven were killed. Uh, 2013, Santa Monica College, California, five were killed. 2014, Sandy Hook Elementary uh, in Connecticut. Uh, 20, the uh, 21st graders and six adults were killed. Uh, 2015, Umpqua Community College in Oregon, nine were killed. 2017, Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, 17 were killed. 2018, Santa Fe High School, uh, 10 were killed. 2022, Robb Elementary, Uvalde, Texas, 21 were killed. 27 March, uh, 2023, Covenant School, Nashville, Tennessee, 7 were killed. 7 June, 2023, Huguenot High School, Richmond, Virginia, 5 were killed at, a grad at the graduation ceremony. So it continues. While school shooters are outliers and extremely rare, the conditions of the digital age have created conditions of emptiness, reactivity, anger, self-centered narcissism, and desensitization. The predictive algorithm of our digital e echo chamber make the user the center of the universe, that's narcissism, while addicting them to highly arousing and numbing content with no sense of intrinsic meaning and purpose. Young teens and young adults are numb and looking to feel anything, a jolt of something to escape their, their emptiness. And we're going to I'm going to explain to you how this works for school shooters. The young, empty, and angry men are actually ghosts. Like any ghost, they, la uh, they lack corporeal substance, and they lack a soul or an identity. They are transparent apparitions that are merely the illusory shadow of a fully formed human. And like the metaphorical hungry ghost of addiction, they have a bottomless and insatiable appetite. In this case, their desperate need to feel something, anything, to feel any sensation. They burn themselves with cigarettes. The pain gives them momentary corporeal existence and identity. And this is why you see them as cutters and burners frequently. A ghost without an autom with an automatic weapon in a crowded gathering is looking for their 15 minutes to validate their, that they exist, a rush to feel alive, power and control that the uh, impotent feeling when hurting others, a uh, delusional sense of accomplishment, some misguided mission where for once they feel a sense of purpose. These empty ghosts are created in our dehumanizing and numbing digital laboratory, Via the digital contagion, they find community and resonance with other outliers in the modern public square, social media sites, and chat rooms. In 2018, we had a school shooting every eight days. So they're trying to feel something. In a sickening twist, the worst of the school shooters are immortalized in first-person shooter violent, violent games. So you, you need to understand how... Whoops, I'm sorry. I'm going the wrong direction. You need to understand what these people are feeling. So you put a gun in their hands and all of a sudden that it gives them a feeling. And this is one of the reasons they're trying to feel. And that's one of the reasons why they, they can shoot people up without even thinking about it. They don't see them as other human beings. They see them, they're just trying to get a feeling themselves. So they can't, they can't empathize with anybody else. These are ghosts. These are people that are empty. So they've started these this first-person sh uh, shooter violent video games, Super Columbine Massacre RPG, where the player assumes the role of Klebold or Harris and shoots figures based on the actual victims of Columbine. If you can imagine that, and this is it right here. That's Klebold and Harris, and this is them in the lunchroom, or the library, I'm sorry. VTech uh, Rampage for Virginia Tech. Uh, where the player stalks from building to building on the Virginia Tech campus, breaking into classrooms full of students. When the designers were asked to take the games off the internet, they uh, demanded donations. In other words, they ransomed their video games. As bizarre as all that seems. 
On 13 October 2021, a woman was raped on the SEPTA uh, commuter train in Philadelphia shortly before 10 p.m. Initially, the attacker approached the woman and started verbally harassing her. Then he started touching her sexually. After 45, 45 minutes of her protests and his increasingly aggressive behavior, he raped her. Not a single person on the car helped the poor woman except uh, after the, uh, the fact uh, when a SEPTA employee called the police. SEPTA surveillance video shows that a couple of the passengers did reach for their phones, but they didn't call 911. Instead, at least two of the passengers seen on the surveillance video were shown holding their smartphones toward the attack and filming it. They filmed the attack. The task of, uh, of AI, uh, artificial intelligence platforms like YouTube, is to develop algorithms that recommend and autoplay videos that optimally encourage users to watch video after video after video. The uh, Artificial Intelligence Research Division's job is to apply neuroscience, neuroeconomics, cognitive and behavioral psychology, moral reasoning, and deep thinking to their coding. This embeds an extremific uh, extremification loop in the alg algorithm that results in a desensitization due to numbness from the repetition. Bong, 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 bong. We live in a prison of two opposing ideas of binary thinking. It is the prison of many borderline personality clients. They fluctuate between uh, one extreme to the other or at any given moment. Uh, the borderline paradox is when the BPD uh, client can embrace both polarities simultaneously. Our society has developed into a binary trap and there cannot be any middle ground. There is also a borderline pain paradox. Individuals with a diagnosis of bipolar, I'm sorry, uh, borderline personality disorder often report experiencing high levels of physical pain as a result of long-term health problems. Yet when it comes to short-term visceral pain, such as acts of self-harm, it isn't felt at all. EEGs of the phenomenon show that during intense short-term pain, borderline personality disorder brains quickly start producing theta waves, the brain waves of sleep, trance, and deep relaxation. In other words, they have, uh, with chronic pain, they, uh, they have extreme reactions to the pain. If they have short-term acute pain, they don't feel it at all. As a matter of fact, they, uh, they get the same brain waves as uh, being asleep or in a trance. We know that when the body is injured, pain-killing endorphins are released to help temporarily numb the pain. Dissociation, the experience of feeling out of your body during intense stress or trauma, also inhibits pain. As on a neurological level, the brain temporarily shuts down all but the most basic functions. That is why for the, B, uh, the uh, borderline personality disorder clients, visceral pain is often underexperienced, while they are also quite sensitive to long-term chronic pain. And that's the binary trap. This phenomenon is ex uh, explains why cutting, burning, or other forms of self-harm often don't hurt the borderline personality disorder client, but are dangerously addictive. They're an endorphin rush, and like dopamine, a person can get habituated to chase the endorphin rush. On a psychological level, many uh, borderline personality disorder clients talk about cutting themselves in an effort to feel something, where otherwise there is no immediate sensation other than numbness. Borderline personality disorder clients tend to engage in what's called splitting, seeing others as all good or all bad, and seeing everything through an extreme black and white binary lens. This is known as dichotomous thinking. This is how everybody, this is how most people think. This is how somebody with borderline personality thinks. It's either good or it's bad. It's black or it's white. Borderline personality disorder clients commit suicide at 50 times a normal rate and are comorbid for addiction 70% of the time. They are reactive, struggle with relationships, and generally have extremely challenging long-term outcomes. 
The causes of borderline personality disorder are caused by three intertwining factors, bad childhoods, bad genes, and living in a bad environment. Borderline personality disorder has over 50% heritability, and you can inherit borderline personality disorder at a higher rate than major depression. Childhood maltreatment, either physical or sexual or neglect, has, uh, was found in the histories of 70% of people with borderline personality disorder. Maternal separation is common, which explains a pronounced uh, fear of abandonment, as is poor maternal attachment, inappropriate family boundaries, parental substance abuse, and serious parental mental illness. Separations, disagreements, and rejections, real or imagined, are the most common triggers for symptoms. A person with borderline personality disorder is highly sensitive to being abandoned and left alone, which then emotionally floods the uh, borderline personality disorder client with intense feelings of anger, fear, suicide, uh, suicidal thoughts, and uh, self-harm, and often leads to extremely reactive and impulsive decisions. The lack of consistent nurturing, structure, and boundaries can be viewed as inflaming or causing the volatile dynamic. 1.6% 1.6% of the U.S. population, or 4 million people, have borderline personality disorder. 20% of the psychiatric inpatient population suffer from borderline personality disorder. 75% of those diagnosed with borderline, borderline personality disorder in the United States are women, though many go undiagnosed or misdiagnosed, and this may be due to a gender bias. Borderline personality disorder clients can be challenging in treatment settings because of their behaviors, which are often corrosive to other clients. That many mental health programs will either refuse to accept them or will refer them elsewhere, citing disruptive and unmanageable behaviors. This sometimes results in clinicians purposely misdiagnosing them to afford the client more treatment options. The borderline personality disorder in their chart condemning them to having difficulty finding treatment. However, there are high rates of self-harm and suicide if proper treatment is not received. They're hard to treat, uh, they're difficult to deal with, so people will misdiagnose them so that they can pass them on to the next guy, the next uh, clinician. The problem is that these people, they have a high rate of uh, self-harm and suicide. So if you don't do something with them, where's the statistic? 50%? uh, That's uh, lots of self-harm. DSM, uh, borderline personality disorder symptoms. Uh, This is, uh, we're looking at uh, the society in general now, not just uh, the individual. Self-damaging behavior, for example, gambling, overeating, substance abuse, record levels of addiction with a record number of over 100,000 overdoses last year, uh, all-time high with self-harm, over 47,000 suicides in the United States. It looks like perhaps our society has borderline personality disorder. Intense but unstable relationships, uh, divorce rates have doubled over the last 20 years, Divorce rates went up 34% during the pandemic. Intimate partner violence has been steadily rising and increased uh, 20% during the pandemic. Uncontrollable temper outbursts, national volatility, and civil unrest seems to be increasing. Combustive incidents are increasing on college campuses. Statistically, violent crime rates have increased in the major cities. And of course, this is from uh, January 6th. Twenty twenty one. Uncertainty about self image, gender goals and loyalties, gender dysphoria has increased significantly. Self defeating behavior, fights, suicidal gestures, or self mutilation, suicide rates were at an all time high the year before the pandemic. Chronic feelings of emptiness and boredom, uh, overstimulation by electronic devices has led to a boredom epidemic. There has been a spike in emptiness and ennui among millennials and Generation Z. 
This is uh, this was an interview that uh, that uh, Carderis did with um, Sarah White. She's a uh, borderline personality. Actually, she's a personality disorder specialist. And this is what she had to say. We find that personality disorders occur most often in first-degree relatives. When treating people with uh, uh, borderline personality disorder, I find that most of them have never experienced trauma, but many interpret normative life adversity as traumatic events. I wasn't picked for the cheerleading squad, and that was traumatic. I was grounded uh, from sneaking out of the house, going to a party, and doing drugs, and that was traumatic. These are all natural, normative life adversity events. One thing that I have seen is a new type of client who presents with a sort of pseudo borderline personality disorder. They present as having these unstable interpersonal relationships, self-image, effects, and impulsivity, but they don't meet all the criteria. In an isolated uh, clinical setting, their symptoms dissipate. Once their needs are met and they are away from their normal stressors, they regulate, improve, and go back. It is, a cl it is clear that they do not uh, and did not have borderline personality disorder. Why? Because they were able to fix them. Normally they, normally they don't. It seems that as we continue to turn our attention to dramatic displays and reward immensely a maladaptive behavior with more attention, we are encouraging the youngest in our society to embrace instability, feeling worthless, always striving but never achieving, and a never-ending competition. So many kids now have watched live streams of individuals cutting themselves, using drugs, and dramatically crying about various situations. This content is not really moderated, and anyone can post and broadcast whatever they like. We also have reality TV, which gives us this unending view into the lives of others, which often are encouraged to, encouraged to display the most interesting, read dramatic, behavior possible to keep an audience interested. Unfortunately, what is interesting and attention-grabbing is also the most unhealthy display of any uh, young person who is developing. People who are pseudo-transgendered are really de detrimental to actually transgendered individuals because they are often engaging in a litany of maladaptive behaviors and behaviors that are atypical for trans individuals. These instances produce fuel for the argument against transgender, transgendered individuals because the pseudo-trans individuals will attempt to use being transgendered as a sacred cow that nobody will ever question and that makes them infallible. Rapid onset gender dysphoria is gender dysphoria that began after puberty. It usually begins around age 7. Though uh, rapid onset gender dysphoria is not officially recognized. Uh, adolescents with rapid onset gender dysphoria did not show any signs of gender dysphoria before puberty, which is unusual. 62.5% have been diagnosed with at least one mental health disorder before declaring their transgender status. Had a sudden and significant increase in their social media usage, 63.5%, before coming out as trans were disproportionately female to male identities at a rate of 80% natal females. Recorded average is 20% female to male. And in other words, most uh, transgendered individuals are males who are transitioning to females at about a uh, one to five clip. But the, the individuals uh, that we are seeing from social media, most of them are females at a, clip, at a uh, one to five clip as bizarre as that may seem. Females to male. After coming out, there was an increase in conflict with parents and an antagonism uh, toward heterosexual and non-trans people. Parents reported being derogatorily called breeders or being routinely harassed by their children who played pronoun police. The children adopted specific trans-positive language that they had seen on social media, and the parents described their children as sounding scripted, reading from a script, wooden, like a form letter, verbatim, word for word, or practically copy and paste. And of course, this is the uh, rock band, The Breeders, uh, 
That's I. That's why I'm, they don't have anything to do with rapid onset gender dysphoria. They just have the name of what the the kids were calling their parents. Our new sedentary, digitally dependent lifestyles are driving us insane and killing us. There is an ample there is ample research that shows that high tech living is driving our record rates of psychiatric disorders, uh, for example, depression, anxiety, and addiction uh, and addiction that are then contributing to our epidemic levels of suicide, overdose, and mass shootings. They, the damage goes beyond our mental well-being. We are experiencing record rates of heart disease, obesity, and cancer. Just as our entire society seems to be imploding in a uh, polarized, angry fireball of societal unrest. It is important for the human psyche to have a strong connection to nature. And this is, this is one of his, uh, uh, he, he wants you to go to uh, salt water and he wants you to go out in nature. This is uh, what Kaderis, uh, Kaderis is uh, it's talking about. And th this, is, this is his propaganda toward nature. It is important, and I agree with the nature part. I'm not sure about the salt water part, but uh, yeah. Nature makes a lot of sense. It is important for human psyche to have a strong connection to nature and the natural world. The root cause uh, or many of, our, uh, of many of our neuroses, both personal and societal, is a disconnect from the earth. Most of us today are so far removed from nature that we don't even realize that we are missing a critical nature connection. We feel stressed and anxious and yet don't even realize that we may be suffering from nature deficit disorder. And this is a joke. Uh, this is called the outdoors. Oh, I've seen this level on my video games. Going outside. Anyway. Of course, you know, you guys are from the uh, Navajo Nation, and you, you're outside all the time, and, you know. Uh, but uh, one of the things you need to know about Carderas, he's from New York City, actually. And... Um, uh, he was an addict. He was uh, actually a uh, drug addict. And uh, he died. Um, he died of a drug overdose. And they brought him back. And when he came back, he became, be, started uh, uh, realizing that he needed to, uh, to do something else. And that's when he became a psychologist. He moved out to the end of Long Island, which is over by the ocean, and it's out in nature, and he took these nature walks and everything. Okay, so uh, this part you, you guys already understand. You, you're, you're already uh, nature filix. You, you, already, you already know this part. As do I. I live in the middle of a cornfield. And I, I brag about that. You guys think, may think I'm, I'm uh, just talking, but the reality is I'm bragging about it. After a cat catastrophic event, a catastrophic event, most people are resilient and reco will recover spontaneously over time. A small percentage of individuals do not respond, and they do require extended psychological care. But researchers found that the single intervention of a therapeutic debriefing session does nothing to alter this dynamic, and the people who didn't bounce back seem to already have psychological vulnerabilities. Studies have found that people at the greatest risk for PTSD have a history of childhood abuse, family dysfunction, or a pre-existing psychological disorder. American pilots who were prisoners of war in North Vietnam highlighted the importance and role that a strong baseline of mental health plays. Although the pilots endured years of torture and solitary confinement, they showed a surprisingly low incidence of PTSD. It was hypothesized that because pilots are screened for psychological health and trained for high-stress combat, they had stronger psychological immune systems and were able to tolerate their trauma in a way that people who were more psychologically vulnerable never could. And I was working in an Air Force hospital. I was in the uh, Air Force when the, uh, the, uh, the uh, POWs came back. Uh, and we got a number of them at uh, one of the larger hospitals in the Air Force, uh, and I can I can attest that this is true. Most of them didn't have PTSD. They were really happy to be home. That's for sure. 
Uh, after 9-11, one survey of 988 adults living close to the Twin Towers, conducted two months after the towers collapsed, found that only 7.5% had been diagnosed with PTSD. That's of the 988 they sur surveyed. Six months later, uh, found only 1.7% of New Yorkers were suffering from prolonged PTSD. This indicates that the most normally psychologically healthy people will naturally get better over time and have innate resilience after being exposed to a traumatic event. The bottom line is the vast majority of people will recover naturally. They don't need any psychiatric treatment. And it's almost instantaneous. Uh, within two months, it was only 7.5%. With, uh, after six months, it was only 1.7%. That means that 98.3% uh, uh, recovered automatically without, without any counseling. We as humans have developed our own reservoirs of strength and resilience in the normal course of our development. What can be helpful is peer support, the AA paradigm, uh, rather than professional psychological counseling. Now, he seems to be going against his own, his, uh, his own job. He actually owns two counseling uh, centers uh, that deal with addiction, actually, uh, Carderas. And he seems to be arguing against himself. The reality is that stress can be beneficial as it builds resilience and, and via the release of the uh, neurohormone oxytocin, the cuddle hormone that's released during times of high stress, we are propelled to reach out to other people and be more social when times are difficult, biologically hardwiring us toward healing socialization. And there you go, a nice hug, and that's what we need. Our modern and technological society has made us less resilient, more reactive and brittle, and more impulsive and lonelier. Our high-tech lives are comprising compromising our psychological immune system, the digital age has stripped children of all the ingredients that are necessary to develop what psychologists call <clears throat> resili resilience and coaches call grit, which are critical ingredients in a person's healthy, social, emotional, and psychological development. In today's click-swipe world, we've created children <clears throat> as instant gratification vessels who have not learned the fundamental life skills of patience and overcoming adversity. We're seeing record rates of impulsivity as evidenced by the almost 50% spike in ADHD. Research shows a link between screen, screen time and ADHD. Screen time, uh, screens are very arousing and stimulating for a child. The child then becomes stimulation dependent and can't focus, focus unless they're being perpetually stimulated. Here we have a lady drinking coffee and, and looking at her cell phone. Overcoddled children are resilience deprived. Resilience building uh, takes patience and perseverance. Adversity, competition, hardships, pain, obstacles, all, that, uh, all of that can develop and strengthen our resilience. Struggles in our lives uh, give us our depth, compassion, and resiliency. They make us human and need not be debilitated. Ver uh, key variables when defining grit are passion and sustained persistence applied toward long-term achievement with no particular concern for rewards or recognition along the way. Grit combines resilience, ambition, and self-control in the pursuit of goals that take months, years, or even decades. But the two ingredients to grit are passion and persistence. Data shows that no more than one or two out of ten people who complete rehab will stay clean and sober for a year. In other words, they fall off the wagon. Others have it, have it at 5%. Regardless, the treatment industry has a lousy batting average. People relapse, and with drugs uh, like fentanyl and oxycontin, fatal relapses of people just out of rehab are more and more common. Falling off the wagon. Our immersion into our screen lives acts as kryptonite on both our grit and any sense of genuine purpose and meaning in our lives. Getting lost on Instagram or gaming or getting sucked into TikTok or YouTube rabbit holes just weakens us, enables our sloth, and robs us of any purpose in our lives. And that 
is it. There you go. All right. And that is the end of the lecture. Pretty good book. I was really impressed. Uh, and, of course, his, uh, his conclusion was that, uh, that you need to uh, go out in nature. And I can't argue with that. That's, that's, a good, that's a good idea. Some of the other stuff, a little bit extreme. Uh, but uh, I, I hope there's something in there that you can take away from, from, uh, uh, from the lecture. It's a long one. I'll talk to you guys next week. I'm not sure what I'm going to tackle next week. I may tackle uh, artificial intelligence or uh, I've got, uh, we'll start with uh, gaming. So I'll talk to you next week.